the enlightening beings who have thoroughly purified the mind in the second stage come to the third stage one enters the third stage by ten conscious focusings of the mind purity stability dissolution dispassion non-retrogression steadfastness ardor tirelessness high-mindedness and magnanimity by consciously focusing the mind on these ten things one enters the third stage furthermore the enlightening beings in this third stage examine the impermanence of all that is conditioned as it truly is and they examine the painfulness impurity unreliability destructibility instability instantaneous arising and passing away not coming to be previously not reaching the past and non-perdurance in the present of all that is conditioned seeing all conditioned things in this way the enlightening beings seeing themselves without refuge without protection in grief sadness distress bound by likes and dislikes with much suffering dejection and turmoil without resources burned by the fires of lust hatred and delusion filled with many diseases cause their minds to be more and more liberated from all conditioned things and direct their minds toward enlightened knowledge the enlightened beings also recognize the inconceivability of enlightened knowledge and recognize its incomparability, its immeasurability, its difficulty of access, its independence, its freedom from affliction, its freedom from distress, and how it arrives at the city of fearlessness and never comes back from it, and how it saves many people. Thus observing the immeasurability of enlightened knowledge and observing how full of ills all conditioned states are, the enlightening beings further develop ten feelings toward sentient beings. The feeling that they are without a leader or a refuge. The feeling that they are always destitute. The feeling that they are burned by the fire of passion, hostility, and folly. The feeling that they are locked in the prison of existence the feeling that they are always veiled in sleep in the thickets of afflictions the feeling that they have abandoned the desire for good the feeling that they have lost the way to enlightenment the feeling that they go along with the flow of the mundane world and the feeling that they have lost the means to liberation seeing the world of sentient beings so full of afflictions the enlightening beings arouse their energy thinking I should rescue and liberate these beings. I should purify and emancipate them. I should lead them, direct them, make them happy, develop them, and cause them to reach perfect peace. Thus, disillusioned with all conditioned things, considerate toward all sentient beings, seeing the benefit in omniscience, taking refuge in enlightened knowledge, dedicated to the salvation of all beings the enlightening beings reflect thus by what means can these sentient beings fallen as they are into so much misery be lifted out of it and established in the ultimate bliss of nirvana and be caused to attain freedom from doubt about all things it further occurs to those enlightening beings the means to do this is nowhere else but in the realm of knowledge of unobstructed liberation and the knowledge of unobstructed liberation is nowhere else but in awareness of all things as they are and awareness of all things as they are is nowhere else but in transcendent knowledge of the unconditioned and unproduced and that light of knowledge is nowhere else but in contemplation by the analytic intellect skilled in meditation and that contemplation by the analytic intellect skilled in meditation is nowhere else but in skill in learning the enlightening beings thus apply this contemplative knowledge to the quest of the buddha way day and night intent on hearing the teaching desirous of the teaching enjoying the teaching delighted in the teaching relying on the teaching devoted to the teaching concentrated on the teaching intent on the teaching taking refuge in the teaching dwelling in the teaching saved by the teaching acting in accord with the teaching while the enlightening beings are thus focused on the quest for the buddha way there is nothing they do not give up goods 
supplies, dwelling, precious things, even their own bodies. And because of their desire for truth, they do not consider this difficult to do. They only consider it difficult to find a person who utters the truth, who teaches even a single phrase of truth. For the sake of the Buddha teaching, there is no external thing whatsoever that they are attached to that they do not give up. And there is nothing whatsoever within themselves that they do not give up. There is no service to teachers they do not take on. There is no pride or conceit they do not abandon, and no humility of action they do not accept. There is no physical suffering they do not bear. They are more glad to hear a single verse of the teaching that they have not heard than they would be to get a galaxy full of jewels. They are more glad to hear a well-spoken verse than they would be to gain kingship. They are more glad to hear a new phrase of teaching spoken by a complete Buddha, purifying, enlightening practice, than they would be to attain godhood for many hundreds of thousands of eons. If someone should declare to the enlightening beings, I too have a phrase of teaching spoken by a perfectly enlightened Buddha that purifies the practice of enlightening beings, which I will tell you if you throw yourself in a great blazing pit of fire and endure the agony. The enlightening beings think, for the sake of even a single phrase of teaching spoken by a completely enlightened Buddha, I would even bear to hurl myself from the heavens into a whole galaxy of fire, to say nothing of an ordinary pit of fire. Indeed, we should seek the Buddha teaching even through all the afflictions and pains of hells, to say nothing of the pains of life in the human world. They thus seek the teachings with such heroic vigor as this, and they contemplate the teachings truthfully as they hear them. Furthermore, having heard those teachings with profound meditation in their own minds, alone in solitary places, they think, It is by realization and practice of the teaching, through appropriate methods, that these doctrines of Buddha are to be followed. They cannot be clarified just by talk. Enlightening beings, in this stage of refulgence, Leave desires and evil and unwholesome things for the sake of realization of the teaching and in practical application. With thought and reflection, becoming aloof, joyful and blissful, they attain the first stage of meditation and abide there. By cessation of thought and reflection, inner purity and mastery of single-mindedness, free from thought and cognition, concentrated, joyful and blissful, they attain and abide in the second stage of meditation. By freedom from desire for joy, they abide in equanimity. With mindfulness and precise knowledge, they experience physical bliss. As the sages say, those who are dispassionate, mindful, blissful and detached from joy, attain to and abide in the third stage of meditation. By the abandonment of pleasure and pain, and by the disappearance of former joy and dejection, free from both pleasure and pain, equanimous with pure mindfulness, they attain to and abide in the fourth stage of meditation. <laughs>